Casey. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matty Taos. I'm one of the pastors here at Epiphany Station. And if you are our guest today, especially our first time guest, I want you to clue you into a few things that might be different about your experience today. The first is kazoos, kazoos, kazoos in church. Um, <laughs> the second is um, if you are um, wanting ever to communicate anything uh, to Epiphany about your experience or you have questions or feedback or anything of the sorts like that, that's why we created our uh, next step cards, our connection cards in which you can use those to communicate several different things. And if you are our guest today, especially a first time, we would love you to go to the welcome station by the front uh, door out there to fill out one of these introduce yourself cards. We have a free gift for you just for being here with us this morning. You can take that away with you. And if you are new to Epiphany Station, you might notice by the end of our experience that we don't pass a plate. And we don't pass a plate intentionally because we don't want our guests to feel like they have to give here at Epiphany. Instead, what we have are the three options of some red boxes in the back for giving, a card reader on a tablet, and also giving online at epiphanystation.com. So that if you want to give, you can do. But we don't want anyone to feel like they have to give to be here at one of our worship experiences. Now the third thing that's a little bit different about our Christmas than maybe what you've experienced in the past is we want to do something every year, something tangible and expressive that helps people understand that we think Christmas can still change the world. It can still change everything about somebody's life in the way it can make an impact. So what we have is what we call My Christmas Epiphany. Every year, something we engage in to seek to change people's lives in our community around the world. And this year, we've started by raising funds to establish a Love People Fund. It's a form of benevolence in which people from the church can go into the mess of someone else's life and actually help them and do good and help them to take steps out of it. And we've raised so far into this fund over $1,000 with more on the way today. And right... <laughs> And with that, we have actually already been able to help a family who was facing eviction this Christmas season by giving them money to be able to meet their rent, but then also helping them with some financial counseling to keep making steps out of that. And that's what really what we want to be able to do with this fund. So if you are considering giving today at Epiphany Station or to the Love People Fund, you can know that this fund, as its team leads, it will make a difference in people's lives, not just in a one-time event, but moving forward for the rest of their days. So thank you very much to those who've already been generous in that way. As we wrap up our Christmas teaching series titled A Messed Up Christmas, um, I want to take a trip down memory lane. And this trip down memory lane might be a little bit bumpy because it's my memory lane and my wife tells me my memory is bumpy. Um, but you might not know this about me, but I have actually had two very prestigious acting roles in my life. My wife also doesn't know about this. And both these roles were in elementary school and were non-speaking parts, but that is not the point. They were still very prestigious, and one of them was actually in the big Christmas you know, nativity play in which I was distinguishedly cast as the donkey. One could not imagine such a thing, but I was a great donkey. I had gray sweatpants, I had a gray sweatshirt, and I had a donkey mask with a rubber band around the back. It was perfect, so good. Actually, we have a picture of it. No, actually, we don't have a picture of it because when I asked my mom for one, she said, it wasn't such a big event that we thought you would want a picture of it. <laughs> Love you, mom. Um, but I was cast as the donkey in nativity. Have any of you ever been in a nativity play? Any of you been in a nativity play? Okay. Uh, were any of you ever like shepherds or wise men? Where are the shepherds and wise men? Okay. Donkeys? Where are my donkeys at? There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, who, was the, who, who was Mary or Joseph? Mary and Joseph? Show-offs, put your hands down. No, no one likes the, the kids that get Mary and Joseph. Just, it's just too much. But these nativity plays that we put on are, are a sign of what, we, what we've come to think of as Christmas. Um, and in these nativity plays, we, and we get it from the Bible, this, this idea of this picturesque scene in which this baby is born and things go really well and really nice and really sweet. It's a great play for kids to act out. And if you look in the book of Luke in chapter 2, starting in verse 15, this is where we, kinda, we, we get it from. It's when the angels have visited the shepherds and they return to heaven and the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village, they found Mary and Joseph and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. 
All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Mary kept these things in her heart, thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. And in our minds, that's roll credits. In our minds, that's end scene. That's the end of the play, and everyone lives happily ever after. But that's not how it goes. That's not the Christmas story. A, a quick recap of what happens next is Jesus and his entire family become fugitives from the government, have to flee to a foreign country until the king dies so they can come back. And they live in abject normalcy and, and boredom all the way up until the point Mary and Joseph along the way kind of lose Jesus in Jerusalem for a few days, but I'm sure they were able to explain that to God pretty simply. We just lost the Savior. Do you have another one? Um, but then it moves on, and it's, it's a long time between Christmas and Nativity until we actually start to see what Jesus came to do and Jesus' destiny. When he starts actually living it out, people don't like it. People get angry, and they start to hate him for what he came to do. It wasn't nice. It's not a nice story. So instead of credits roll, there's a part two to the Christmas story. I want you to consider our conversation today, the Christmas story part two, the sequel, The Donkey's Revenge. And it, <laughs> not bitter, not bitter. And in there, we start to see, as we continue, how so many people were so sure of who Jesus was going to be and what he was going to do, yet what they expected and what was reality, they did not seem to connect. So after the Christmas story, 30 years later, roughly 30 years later, we find Jesus telling people about himself, around 30, because that makes sense, because who's going to listen to a guy in his 20s? They don't know anything as it is, or at least I was told that in my 20s. But he starts saying who he is, and people start freaking out. And they start freaking out because they tend to expect what's going to happen. So many people have been waiting for Jesus for so long that they're expecting a, an earthly king, a dynamic, dominant leader who's going to take the throne of Israel, become their new king, lead them in revolution against the Romans, and go on to conquer nation after nation. This is the Messiah they were looking for. And they were just looking for signs and symbols that he was the right guy. They were ready to make him their king. And it came about around one special time in which Jesus was performing a miracle in which he fed thousands of people with very little food, that the people were ready to spring into action. In John 6, it says, when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet that we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Apparently, Jesus is not on board with this plan that they have, these expectations that they have. It's a good plan, but he's just not up for it. And in fact, if you look through the Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you, you ever see these instances, there are so many times in which followers of Jesus are like, all right, Jesus, let's go. Now we're ready to pull the trigger. Let's go and take over the, the Pharisees and take over the government, and let's go and do this thing. And Jesus just shakes his head in utter disbelief and disconnect from what they're expecting. Because as they look at Jesus, they think the best thing that could happen now is what they can imagine and what they can conceive. And they, they're looking forward to a repeat of the good old days. Let's get ourselves another King David. Let's slay some giants, kick some tail, take some names. Israel will be great again. Jesus is going to bring victory over the problems that they feel they can see and need to be dealt with. He's going to be the type of Messiah that makes most sense to them. And continuing on, long after Jesus' birth and life and teaching and healing and death and resurrection, they still don't get it. In Acts 1.6, it says, when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, is, is it time? Lord, has the time come when you're going to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And we shouldn't think badly of these people because they're not too different from us. You see, when we conceive a problem or, or we feel like we're in despair or hopelessness, all we can ever usually think of how we're going to get out of that is what our minds can perceive and conceive, what we've usually seen in the past. And we would respond in very much the same way, and we do respond in the same way. Is when we come to a relationship, we want to have anything to do with God, we tend to bring our expectations of what kind of God He's going to be and how He should do this and how He should establish and restore 
our kingdom. We all do it. And the problem is that we are not he. We are not this king. It's not our throne and it's not our kingdom. And we don't get to set the expectations for how everything is going to play out in our lives and what is most important. So Jesus seems to spend a lot of time setting expectations, setting expectations that actually make sense. We use this term a lot, um, unrealistic expectations. It's usually a term you're introduced to in around like the second year of marriage, because all up until then, it's all realistic. And around year two, you start to think to yourself, it should be realistic that him biting his toenails on the couch would stop by this point. But it's an unrealistic expectation, ladies, and it's a man's prerogative. Um, Also, we consider and think to ourselves, it should be realistic that kids would think to, you know, turn their clothes the right way around before putting them in the hamper at some point. But that's just doubly unrealistic. You may not even buy a hamper. Just get a shovel and a burn pile in the back and live your life that way for the first 10 years. We set all these unrealistic expectations, and when we think of unrealistic expectations, we think of them in the negative sense We'd love it to be here, and it's here. But unrealistic expectations work in the opposite way, too. We just don't often think of them that way. Because an only unrealistic expectation is just an expectation not founded in reality. And when we deal with God, our unrealistic expectations are usually because we set the bar so ridiculously low. For, for issues, for problems, for things that we can see and consider, we say, this is what's going to happen. This is what I can expect God to do, and we miss the greater, the brighter, the grander vision of what God is going to do in our lives. That's what happened to these people when they saw Jesus. It's what happens to us when we start a relationship with God. So Jesus, once and for all, as he's coming towards the end of his life, he he dispels myths about what he came to do. At a time when all of his followers are are scattering and swooning because he's been captured, he's on trial, he's probably going to die And in there, Jesus is stood in front of a Roman official who brings the accusation against him. People say you're going to be a king, and that's a problem for us. In John 18, Pilate said, so you're a king? You're a king, right? Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. Jesus says, I was born for this. I was born for this. I wasn't born to be whatever other people think I should be. I was born for this one reason, to tell people the truth. That's baby Jesus' destiny. That's what his life was lived out for. And no matter what his friends or his family, his followers or his enemies were expecting, that is what he was going to do. He's not David. He's not political. and He's not a revolutionary. He's come for something with greater purpose. It says in verse 36 of John that, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Christmas means that Jesus came to carve into eternity the establishment of a different type of kingdom. An offer from God that we could have relationship, that we could be citizens of heaven. A far greater title than citizens of any nation on earth. And then he is not the king that we might want, but he is the king that we need. He didn't come to fix all of our little problems here and there. He came to show us a path to absolute perfection. What's messed up about Jesus' identity and his destiny is that he came to save, and to save meant to die. Now, I want to take a minute here and just appreciate with you that I'm ruining Christmas. I mean, you know, let's be honest. You didn't come here for this, I'm going to have a cheery message, and this guy's making it all upset. Now, that's true. And the reason that it's true is because we have really messed up the Christmas story. We have really messed it up. If the biggest thing about our Christmas is presents that we buy for each other and and the obligatory rush and pressure and stress and the argument over happy holidays, then we've really missed what Christmas is supposed to reflect what it really meant when it happened, that that everything in the world would change because of Christmas. So it needs ruining again. It needs messing up and it needs moving and shifting and changing into back what it is because we have messed it up by prettying it up and cleaning it up. And we've removed the teeth from the Christmas story so that Christians now live it the same way everyone lives out Christmas. 
The beginning of the Christmas story needs the end of the Christmas story. And the end is a 30-year-long tale. And if we don't have the end and understand it, what does a nativity scene even mean? All we did is we took the first few lines of the Christmas story and said, bing, bang, boom, there's a play that kids can put on. And now we've established that that's all Christmas was. And it started and it finished there. Instead of considering what Christmas came to do was Jesus giving us something new. And that's why the whole story is messed up. And we have to appreciate that it's messed up so we can get into it, so we can see that it's real. Because a messed up story is a real story. A messed up Christmas story is relatable to a person who knows that their story is messed up. The Christmas story is bound up in moments of shame and dishonor and guilt and deceit. It has in it fear and confusion and anger and abuse. And in it, it has people who die and they lie and they cry. And in all of that mess, the Savior of the world is born. My story and your story likely has enunciating moments of shame and dishonor and guilt and deceit and fear and confusion and anger and abuse. And in your story, you have people who will die and who will lie and who will cry. And in all of that mess, in all of that real life, that's where the Savior of the world is born. So that we would understand that Jesus was for the messed up. He came here so that he could step into messed up lives and change everything. That is why it is okay that the story is messed up. That's why okay that it gets darker and darker and darker. That the Christmas story gets darker and darker. That Jesus' story gets darker and darker and darker. And that our stories continue to get darker and darker and darker. It is all so that we would be able to understand and fathom That in that darkness, in that real life darkness, that messed up story that we live in, we would be able to understand that that is there so that we would be able to see a bright light. A bright light that flashes in the darkness, that is seeable, that is noticeable because of the darkness that surrounds it that we would be able to appreciate that there is light in the Christmas story so that there can be light in our stories. Jesus didn't come to make things nice. He came to seek and save the lost who felt like they were walking in darkness. He came to show those who felt unlovable that they're loved, that lived in conflict, that there could be peace. That's what the Christmas story means. And it doesn't end with the shepherds going home and the wise men going home and Mary holding baby Jesus. The Christmas story continues, and it continues in your life today. Now, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men, they've all made their response to Christmas. They've they've carved into history how they respond to the first Christmas. The only question befitting you is, how do you respond to the message of Christmas? How do you respond that this happened, that Jesus sought to establish something, and apparently it was established because here we are 2,000 years later talking about it. How will you celebrate Christmas differently this year in light of what it really means? If you want, and it's completely up to you, I have a couple of things that you could do to celebrate Christmas differently this year. Three things, three steps that can make this the most Christmassy Christmas that Christmas has ever Christmased, if you want. It's good English, right? It's my language. Leave it alone. The first step that you need to take is to understand that it's okay for it to be messed up that your Christmas doesn't need to be perfect. It's okay if your life feels dark. And that is so that you can take the first step. It's so that you can look for the light. To take the step to look for the light. See, all Jesus ever tried to do was to show you something, was to tell you something. All he tried to do his entire life, all the church has been trying to do for decades and centuries and millennia is to tell you Jesus is a light in your darkness. That in messed up, that's what he came to be. That's salvation. So ask the question today and tomorrow and this week, where is Jesus in my story? Because he came to mess up your destiny. He came to mess up your marriage, and he came to mess up your parenting and mess up your finances and mess up your life so that you would know that your destiny is not just this. Your destiny is something greater and something more beautiful while you're here, and your destiny is heaven. Your destiny is a child of God. That's what he came to communicate to you. 
So ask the question, where is Jesus? If you need to talk to somebody about that, we would love to start that conversation with you. It's what our connection cards are for, so you can let us know where you're at. And if you want to be in communication with someone, we would love to connect you with someone. The second thing to do is after looking for the light is to share the light. I'm going to challenge every single one of you, and I don't really care whether you're a believer of 80 years or never will be. I want you to do one thing for me tomorrow, all of you. I want you to talk about Jesus. Terrifying, I know, especially at Christmas, it's least expected. But this idea that all Jesus came to do, and the reason we celebrate Christmas is to testify that there's some truth to what he said, is it doesn't seem too far-fetched that we would talk about the guy for one day at least. And there's one thing that I want you to do, because you're already terrified of the idea of mentioning his name. May as well talk about politics around the Christmas table this year. But what I want you to do is I want you to grab a Bible at some point in your day tomorrow. You can be on your own. You can be surrounded by everyone. It can be to your kids, your parents, your family, your banker, your waiter. I don't care. Grab a Bible. If you don't have one, we have a bunch out at the Next Step Station, the Welcome Station. Please grab one as a gift. And I want you to read one verse out loud. It's not a Christmassy verse, but it is a verse that helps us understand what Christmas means. I challenge you all to read this one verse out loud tomorrow. John 1, 29. It's about one man when he understood who Jesus was when he saw him coming, and we understand who Jesus is when we see him coming at Christmas. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what Christmas means. Not just a new baby, but new life for us. That we can be freed from the shackles of sin that separate us from God. That separate us from heaven and instead we can call Jesus what he is. The king of heaven. So look for the light and share the light and finally be the light. I want you to distinguish yourself tomorrow. Distinguish yourself this week as someone who insists that Christmas is not about you. Do something drastic, do something miraculous to say to people, I want to show you that I care about you this year. Do something unexpected. Invite someone that's not in your usual circle to Christmas dinner or over for a drink. Shove up someone's yard or shove up someone's driveway that's not your own. 303 Miriam Avenue North needs doing, just in case anyone wants that thrown out. <laughs> Give somebody a gift. Not begrudgingly, not because it's expected, but because you want to show them that you care about them. This is a season unlike any other, in which more people are excited and more people are depressed. More people are surrounded by family and more people are alone. The way that we can make Christmas truly beautiful, the way that we take a messed up Christmas story and we make it beautiful, is to declare what Jesus came to declare. To testify to the truth that no matter what's going on in your world, the mess or the darkness. God loves you, he cares about you, and he needs you to know that. That's why it's all here. That's why Jesus came to be the savior, not that we wanted, but that we needed, so that we could respond and we could then go share that with the rest of the world. And as we love God and love people in this season, it is a unique opportunity to take the messed up Christmas story, put it in our messed up lives, and make something beautiful out of it. So I challenge all of you as you leave here today and get in your cars and you go home or you go and eat or you do whatever to carry that with you, that you are responsible to be part of this life change, to respond to the light that Jesus wants to show and to respond by sharing that with others. I'd love to pray for you and I'd love you to pray for those around you and for yourself. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you that you are first and foremost unrelentingly patient and loving. And that the Christmas story just displays that. It communicates um, your affection to do what is necessary to communicate your love. And you did it through messed up circumstance. Through uh, broken power paradigms and heritage. And, and through reputations and destinies that where what was expected and what was thought was not lived out. So as we live out our lives and our destinies and we see our reputation, power, and heritage at play, we would understand your part in our lives. We would look to the Christmas story as so much more than a nice story, but the story, the one that has the greatest impact on our lives, as you declare your love for us. 
God, I ask you to change us. I ask you to move in us at Christmas and make this the Christmas that mattered, the one we look back on. We thank you and we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.